once I got the pro ball, I was wearing myself down. Okay. So like I would have, I'd come into spring training, like I was shot out of a rocket <laughs> and it's awesome to have a really good spring training, but it's February. And then the season doesn't end until October. Right. So I started to realize like, all right, I need to plan this out a little better. Yep. Uh, I need to have like an actual routine. I need to have a structure. Like I can't go in and lift or run or have a three hour workout. And then it'd be expected to go perform at the highest level each and every time out. Yep. And even if you don't do that, you don't feel great <laughs> anyway. Hello, and welcome to the Physical Preparation Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Robertson, and I will be joined on the line today by Josh Lindblom, a 15-year vet of professional baseball. Now, as always, you know, normally I like to go in and we do our week that was, what's new in my neck of the woods. We are not doing that right now, so both myself and the amazing people that produce my podcast get a little bit of a break around the holidays. So, Instead, what I'm featuring is probably my personal highlight of this episode and the thing that really resonated to me. And I mean, it was really hard because I think the world of Josh, uh, I think he is just such an outstanding human being, not just a baseball player, an outstanding human being, high level character. And he shares all kinds of real world applicable information in this episode. But I think the thing that stuck out the most for me in this show was Josh's talk about just selling out to the process versus the outcome. And I think this is something we can all learn from and we can all benefit from, right? Because we've all set those outcome-based goals. or We've all focused on the outcome only to be just crushed when something doesn't go our way, right? Like we don't land that big client. We don't get that promotion. We don't end up opening a gym or whatever the case may be for us, right? But instead of focusing so much on the outcome, we need to focus instead more on the process. So let's say our goal is to become a high level trainer, coach, rehab professional. Okay, well, how do we do that? Well, we're gonna take 15 minutes every day and we're going to do some form of con ed. We're gonna watch a video, we're gonna listen to a podcast, we're gonna dive into that course that we've had sitting <laughs> on our computer for the last three months and haven't touched, right? So we're going to spend 15 minutes doing con ed. We're going to create a, so a piece of social media content maybe every day or three times a week that's going to help us better educate either other trainers and coaches or the clients and athletes that we work with because that's such an important piece of this, right? Being able to communicate and relay your thoughts. Maybe it's as simple as videotaping one of our client sessions and then breaking stuff down after the fact and trying to figure out, well, why didn't they respond well to that cue when they were squatting? What could I have done instead? Could I have given a different cue? Should I have given a different exercise? So being really critical, not in a negative way, but being critical of ourselves as coaches and trying to dive in and figure out what we can do to make ourselves better. So instead of saying, hey, I'm going to be the best strength coach on the planet, just say, hey, I can't control the outcome but I can absolutely control the process. And I can do these little things on a daily basis that are gonna allow me to become the best possible coach that I can become. So like I said up top, guys, I think the world of Josh, this is an absolutely fantastic episode. So we're gonna take a quick break and then we're gonna jump into this awesome chat with my guy, Josh Lindblom. Believe it or not, 2022 is right around the corner and I wanna help you make it your best year ever. As 2021 wraps up, I've made it a goal to totally revamp my online coaching platforms. The fact of the matter is I want to help more people than ever before, and that starts with people like you. So if you're interested in getting in the best shape of your life this year, I've got two options that might interest you. Option number one is my private online coaching. Here, we'll essentially take offline training and move it online. We'll start with an initial startup call to learn all about you, your needs and goals, I'll create a custom, personalized program that's going to help you achieve said goals, and we'll communicate regularly to make sure that you're on the right track and getting great results. I'm only taking a maximum of five new clients in 2022, so if you're interested in my one-on-one online coaching, send me an email at mike 
at robertsontrainingsystems.com. Now, private coaching may not be for everyone. So if that's the case, I'm also totally revamping my RTS annual program for 2022, and that could potentially be a great fit for you as well. In this program, we go through four three-month phases of training, building the engine, leaning season, athletic domination, and stronger. But the cool part of this program is that it's more than just a training program. Every month, you'll not only get a new workout to follow, but we'll also set monthly challenges where we develop habits in regards to nutrition, recovery, and mindset to help ensure that next year is your best year ever. And trust me, I know the last two years haven't always been kind to our habits and routines, so that portion of the program alone is worth the price of admission. If you're interested in an annual training group, you can learn more at robertsontrainingsystems.com forward slash annual. And if you've got any questions whatsoever, feel free to email me directly at mike at robertsontrainingsystems.com and I'll do my best to point you in the right direction. Okay, that's enough from me. Thank you so much for listening and I'd love the chance to work with you and help you make 2022 your best year ever. Josh Lindblom is an American professional baseball pitcher in the Milwaukee Brewers organization. He previously played in Major League Baseball for the Los Angeles Dodgers, Philadelphia Phillies, Texas Rangers, Oakland Athletics, and the Pittsburgh Pirates, as well as spent a multi-year stint in South Korea playing for the Lati Giants and the Doosan Bears. Now in this show, Josh and I take an honest look at what success means to him. We obviously talk about pitching at the highest level, but we also talk about the ups and downs that he's endured throughout his career. We also talk about the mental side of high-level sports, and I think many of the lessons that Josh shares with us are universally applicable in whatever career you're currently pursuing. This was just an amazing chat. I am a huge fan of Josh, and I think you're really, really going to love this episode. But enough for me. Let's do this. Josh, man, thanks so much for coming on the show here today. Really excited to chat with you. Could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, we might need a part one and a part two um, <laughs> for my for my bio. Born and raised in Indiana, married the eleventh year this year. We have four kids. We have an eight year old, soon to be seven year old, five year old, and a four month old. Play professional baseball for a living. Currently in the Brewers organization. Um, and next year will be my 15th season in <laughs> professional baseball. <laughs> Dude, that's crazy. That's crazy. I, I, so I was uh, playing catch over at Purdue. My last start was in Indianapolis this year. And they had an incoming freshman. And he was like, hey, what, what year did you graduate at Purdue? And I was like, oh, was 2008 was my final season. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I was five years old. And like, I just, in my mind, I was like, I might need to move on here soon. Like I can't be (laughs) playing catch with guys that were five when I started playing pro ball. (laughs) I know. I know. Uh, I had this realization the other day because like Keelan's not a young guy in in the basketball world, but I looked at his birthday and it was like August 3rd, 1995. I was like, holy crap. I was a senior in high school when he was born. Yeah. Yeah. We're old men, dude. I know. I hate looking at the same deal. I hate looking at the birthdays on the scoreboards when guys come up. (laughs) (laughs) I can only imagine what that's like, dude. Okay. So you're obviously not a physical prep coach, but that's also why I wanted you on. And I want to take this in kind of a little bit different route. So start by just telling us a little bit about your career arc, because 15 years in, you've been some places, you've done some things. I would love to just hear kind of how you got started and then take us up to where you're at today. Yeah. So I was drafted and well, dropped out of high school by the Houston Astros in the third round, decided not to sign. Um, this young, immature, wasn't ready for it. Luckily, I had people around me that could help me with that, that decision. Went to University of Tennessee my freshman year, transferred back to Purdue for my sophomore, junior year, was drafted after my junior year by the Los Angeles Dodgers, decided to sign, made my debut in 2011 with the Dodgers, and then... 11, 12, I was with the Dodgers, traded at the deadline to the Phillies, and then I got traded to the Rangers, and then I got traded to the A's, and then I started wondering if everybody wanted me or nobody wanted me, <laughs> and that was 2014. We had had our son. We're sitting in Carmel 
at the hospital. It's probably about four hours after he's born. And my agent calls me and says, hey, team from Korea calls. Uh, you've got about 24 hours to make this decision if you want to go or they're going to pull the contract. Okay. So my wife and I say, all right, well, let's go to Korea. <laughs> um, so spent 2015, 2016, part of 2017, 2018, 2019, all in Korea. After 2019, I signed back with the Milwaukee Brewers, and that's we're sitting here today. I'm going into the final year of uh, my contract, so okay, see what happens. So, talk to me about those years in Korea, dude. What was that <laughs> like? Because I'm assuming, like, maybe some people speak English, but probably not a lot. So, how mm -hmm. was that experience? You'd be surprised how much you can get done with knowing two or three foreign words okay. uh, in a country. No, it was it was unbelievable. My family loved our experience. Our kids basically grew up there. Uh, I would leave in the, at the end of January, and then I wouldn't get home until about November the 2nd, like right around now. Right. But the week before Thanksgiving. So you get November, December, you get three months in the U.S. So for nine months, we're in Korea for five years. But it was, I mean, it was just an unbelievable experience. I mean, you would never dream of going to Korea for anything like no right. one's no one's sitting at home you know six months before christmas break and saying oh well, let's go to korea <laughs> for christmas break this year let's go to japan right. but it, it was just amazing uh we basically lived in like Times square everyone knows the gangnam style song yeah the music video was recorded on the roof of the place where we lived it's just amazing fans are amazing country's amazing food's amazing just everything about it. our kids still ask when we can go back that's per, that's a pretty good stamp of approval right there, man. That's yeah. awesome. That's cool. Okay. So talk to me about like physical preparation, right? Like mm -hmm. how did you get started working out? How did you realize, hey, this is maybe something that could help me become a better pitcher? Yeah. So this is also another long winded winding <laughs> um, story. Um, and I mean, I think the first thing I'll say is like no one's self-made. Right. Like when I look back on my career, I've been so blessed to have unbelievable coaches that have guided me along this path. So the first time that I ever stepped in a weight room, I was in probably third or fourth grade and the Joe Tiller, I'm going to go back. So sorry for you, IU fans, but so the Joe Tiller regime comes in at Purdue, yeah. great, great, show on turf. I don't know how. I think my dad ran into the head strength coach that came in with coach Tiller at Einstein bagels, uh, <laughs> randomly one day. And they started talking and he was like, well, I'd love my son to get some, some instruction on like how to lift properly, just learn, learn the correct lifts. So the first time I ever stepped into a weight room was in Purdue football's weight room oh, wow. um, when I was like a third or fourth grader. Okay football teams in there, you know, everyone's in there and I'm just like learning how to squat. I'm learning how to bench. I'm learning how to deadlift. Uh, I've got, you know, five pounds on the, right on the bar. He asked, he's like, did you have fun? I said, yeah, I had a lot of fun. He's like, well, why don't you come back again next week? And so from the time I was in like third or fourth grade and hopefully no one from compliance is listening to this until I was in about probably eighth grade, I would go over to Purdue three or four times a week and I would lift. Wow. Um, that's cool. And so like, I mean, I have some like amazing stories with the guys that were there and those were, you know, for Purdue football, those were like the dates, right. You know, the Rose bowl team. Like I remember in the summertime going over there to lift and they didn't have enough players for ultimate Frisbee. So I'm playing ultimate Frisbee with Drew Brees, Vinny Sutherland, Seth Morales, Tim Stratton, Matt Light, Wow. And like looking back on it, I'm like, and at the moment, like I thought it was really cool. But then I look back now and it's like, wow, what a, what an amazing group of guys to have around you. Right. To like watch how they work. Yep. So that was my first introduction to strength and conditioning. Uh, pretty, pretty solid one. Yeah, no, that doesn't um, suck, dude. Yeah, no, not by, <laughs> not by any means. <laughs> And then obviously that laid a foundation in high school to go in and know, know what I was doing, know what it looked like, you know, for an athlete to like go in and work, yep. uh, what that work day looked like, what it meant to actually get a workout in and focus. Yep. 
Uh, and then that carried over into college and then pro ball. And like, I look back on that and knowing where we've come from and realizing like how we get to where we're sitting today is like so important in our lives and our careers. Yeah. I look back on that and like coach Lathrop just recently retired, but like, he's the guy that got me into strength and conditioning. Yeah. And like, I'm probably not sitting here today if, if I don't have that in my life. Yeah. Um, so I think it's always important to go back and, you know, reminisce about this stuff and think about it and be thankful for it. Yeah, no, that's amazing, dude. So talk to me about the evolution, right? Because like you said, you've been doing this 15 years. You can't squat, bench and deadlift forever, right? Or maybe you can, but a lot of times you guys need yeah. to turn a little bit more in baseball. So talk to me about how your training has evolved over the years. Yeah, I would say I always erred on the side of doing way too much in my career. Okay. I needed to have a two hour lift. I needed to, you know, go out and just do more. Like I always thought that more was the answer. Right. And you, when you're in high school, when you're in college, like you can kind of get by with that. Sure. Because the demand isn't as much on your body and your mind. Yep. So like everything that we do, the way that I kind of look at it is everything that we do as an athlete or whatever it might be in the workforce as a coach, so everything's inputs and outputs and like it's positives and it's negatives. And you have this like chart. And so like what I eat, what I, the way that I sleep, stress that comes upon me. And like, I realized like once I got the pro ball, I was wearing myself down. Okay. So like I would have, I'd come into spring training, like I was shot out of a rocket <laughs> and it's awesome to have a really good spring training but it's February and then the season doesn't end until October. Right. So I started to realize like, all right, I need to plan this out a little better. Yep. Uh, I need to have like an actual routine. I need to have a structure. Like I can't go in and lift or run or have a three hour workout. And then it'd be expected to go perform at the highest level each and every time out. Yep. And even if you don't do that, you don't feel great <laughs> anyway. So right. like it doesn't, it, does, it doesn't, doesn't matter. And I mean, some of the coaches that are listening to this might want to argue with me on this, but like lifting weights doesn't make you a better baseball player. That's what's hard about baseball is that like you can, there are certain like crossovers, like you can get stronger, you can get faster. And those translate really well to like basketball or football. Right. But in baseball, if I go up my deadlift to 600 pounds, that doesn't mean that I'm going to throw more strikes or get more outs. Right. Right. Whereas like in football, like if I can deadlift or squat 600 pounds, like I'm going to be stronger than you. I can probably run you over. Right. But baseball, that's hard. So you really have to be very calculated in what you're trying to accomplish. That's wow. That's a really good answer. And one of the things that I like to talk about with especially athletes as they evolve is like, well, what got you here won't get you there. And that's hard for a lot of people, right? And I was talking about this with Hunter Owen a couple of weeks ago, but it's like, man, for a while when he was in college, he saw this direct correlation between, man, I'm getting stronger, I'm hitting more bombs, right? And I'm playing better. Then he didn't see that correlation anymore. So it's like, okay, once you get to a certain point, it's like the force production, the strength development, it may help you a little bit, but it's diminishing returns. Yeah. And and that's something I think we see a, across most sports other than maybe football or mm -hmm. something like that. But yeah, I mean, you can't just push the strength button forever and hope that that's going to yeah. keep getting you to ever higher levels of performance. Yeah. So kind of where I really started to realize that. So after my first year in Korea, um, which is actually when I met you guys. So I threw 200 innings my first year in Korea. The year before I threw like I was I had gotten hit with a comebacker. I broke my tibia. I threw around like a, a hundred innings. Yeah. And then the next year I jumped and I threw over 200, which is insane in baseball. Right. To make that big of a jump. And I just had some, like, I had some forearm stuff. I had some shoulder stuff. Like in my mind, it's worst case scenario. Um, I'm going under the knife and I realized like, I can't continue to train the way that I'm training. Uh, and you're a good friend. Um, there were some other circumstances that pushed me to you guys. Yeah. But Eric Cressy was like, go to, go to Mike um, and Bill at IFAST. And this goes back to what we were talking about earlier of like knowing what you've gone through to get to where you are 
Like I just look at the evolution that you guys have even made in the gym over the last, what would it be six or seven years that I've trained with you all to where you are now. And it's been cool to watch that process of everything just get like dialed in more yeah. and more. And like, there's just, there's just no guesswork. Like you go in, you lay on the table with Bill and you, you guys sit down and you write the programming. And it's like, at this point you guys know me. So like I walk in and Bill says, Oh yeah. Like totally expected <laughs> that you need to, you need to do X, Y, Z. Right. And that way, like I'm not wasting time doing 15 other things trying to like balance this schedule out. Like, yep. I mean, I hate to say it, but I don't have eight hours a day as a dad, as a husband right. to go work on this stuff. Like I have to be very, very calculated in the three to four hours that I have during the course of the day to train and accomplish tasks. Yeah. Well, in recovery becomes a real thing too, right? Mm -hmm. Like you hate to admit it, but you know, at late thirties, your recovery is not what it was late twenties or mm -hmm. early twenties. So, you know, if we're trying to craft a four hour workout for you and touch all the bases, including the ones you don't need, it's like, yeah. dude, we're wasting time, man. We're wasting resources yeah. versus yeah. being very specific in what you need. Yeah. hundred percent. Okay. So another area that I'm super fascinated by in baseball is this mental approach, right? It's an mm. incredibly mentally taxing sport. So I realize this may be kind of a basic question for you, but how do you mentally prepare to pitch at a high level? Uh, spend 15 years doing it. No, <laughs> uh, that's something that I never really took seriously, probably until the last 10 years of my career, I would say maybe, mm. um, which seems like a long time. It but does. Like, in my mind, like it's not that long because I think of when I was younger, like when I was seven, eight, nine, obviously you're not talking about, Hey, Johnny, what are you thinking about when you're at the plate? Like what's your, <laughs> right? what's your approach? What are your, you know, what are your centering words? Where's the, where's the spot you look at to control your breath when, right. but really focusing in on, all right. And this kind of goes back to the, the strength and conditioning side is like, once you, you hit a certain point in your athletic career, and the gap in ability and strength starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller. When you're seven, eight, nine year old, the bigger, faster, stronger kid wins. Right. When you start to get to high school, that gap gets a little bit shorter and yeah. smaller. Once you get to college, now you're now it's a lot smaller. And then you get into pro ball, and it's like the ability level is very, very similar across the board. And you have to find a way to be able to separate yourself. Yeah. And it really, probably in Korea is when I really started to realize this from a competitive standpoint is that your opponent does not care how you feel, <laughs> nor, nor do they even know how you feel. Right. And I think in my, like in my mind, I always thought like, oh, you know, he, he knows that I don't feel very good. And it wasn't until I realized like the guy in the box is just as nervous as I am. Yep. It's who is going to be able to control and channel those nerves better is probably going to be the one that's going to win that given pitch, that given out, that given inning. Yeah. Um, so learning how to channel those emotions and those feelings in a positive way was kind of like the key to that for me. I gotcha. I got you. And what made you, what made you realize that, Hey, look, like this is something I can use. Cause you, like you said, mm -hmm. this isn't something you've done forever. And that's weird because I've seen you have discussions with guys and it's like a 20 minute mm -hmm. rest break conversation on, Oh, I do this versus this. So like, when did you realize, Hey, this is something I can use to help me get an advantage over everybody else. Yeah. This is funny. So I'm sitting in the dugout in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I'm watching at the time, he was, a, he was an older pitcher on the other team. And I think he was leading, leading the league in like e pretty much every single category. And right. we're about halfway through the year. This guy's like 87 to 90, maybe 91. And he's just carving dudes <laughs> up. And I'm like, I am better than this guy. Right. Physically my stuff, like I am better than this guy, but why is he performing better than I am? 
Yeah. So I just went up and like started having a conversation with him. Like, what are you thinking? He's like, and then we got into this mental talk. Yeah. And then I realized like, oh, there might be something to this. So then like, I just committed myself to, to learning as much as I could about it. Learn about the process, you know, what, what's my process that I can control. And then whatever happens, happens like the result. I mean, it's cliche, but like, you really don't have any control over a result, but if you, if you can nail and dial in your process mm. for how to make a pitch, like that becomes so, so important. Yeah. I'd assume it becomes way more automatic then, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It becomes automatic. And it's so, you know, I have like foundationally, I, I learned who I was as a pitcher. So like I, I tell a lot of guys, so, and this can be translated and contextualized in any sport. So like, there's three things that I tell myself that I tell guys, like there's three things that you need to be able to do. And those are different for everybody else. One of them has to be a constant and the other two, you've got to be able to do like a good amount of the time. And this forms like the basis for my process okay. and how I execute. So the first one is compete. And you're like, well, everybody says compete. Like, what does that mean? So for me to compete is it's all of the preparation that goes into when I stand on the mound before my start. Okay. And Derek Lowe, pitcher of the Red Sox, Dodgers, Braves, uh, conversation I have with him. He's like, you ask yourself one question before you step on the mound. And it's, have I done everything that I can to be ready for today? If you can say yes, then if you go out and you give up 15 runs, so what? You 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 accomplished the task that was at hand. You right. you you went through your process. And then the, the second part of that competition is it doesn't matter how I feel, it doesn't matter how sick I am, I've got to get up and do the podcast like yes. you're doing today. Yeah. Like nobody, nobody cares how you feel. Right. If I'm at if I'm at 10% and my kids were crying all night last night, I got no sleep. The guy across from me doesn't know that. I still have to go out and find a way to get stuff done. So that kind of like encapsulates the definition of compete for me. Yeah. The second the second one is I command my fastball. The third one is I can throw multiple pitches for a strike. So that let that like that lays the foundation for me of who I am. And I know who I am better than anybody else. Yeah. And I see a lot of athletes. They don't, they don't even know what they're good at. And it's like, like, what's your game? What is your game? And, you know, Yao Ming's not going to try to be Michael Jordan. Right. Like, it's just, it's impossible. I can't go out and try to be Jacob DeGrom because I don't throw 101 miles an hour. Right. So that looks different for every single person. But when you focus, when I focus on those three things, I can always compete. I can always go out and try to give my team a chance to win. Yep. If I'm commanding my fastball and I'm competing, I've got a pretty good chance that day. If I'm doing all three, that day has a could be really special. So like I'm always just going back to that. Like I'm always yeah. thinking of those things. I love that, dude. That's such a good way to look at things too. And you know, it, it is cliche, like the whole know yourself thing, but it's it's universally true, right? Whether we're talking about mm -hmm. sports, whether we're talking about coaching, like I'm a certain type of coach. I'm not, mm -hmm. you know, the rah-rah motivational guy that's going to like get everybody pumped up, but that's okay, right? As long as you mm -hmm. know who you are and you can channel that and focus that energy, man, it gives you such a, a much better chance of success going forward. So I love that, dude. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah. And that, I, I sat down and did that. And honestly, those haven't changed. Like, yeah. I probably did it 10 years ago and those have been the exact same. That's amazing. The exact same. That's cool. Okay. And whenever I'm struggling, I go back to that. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I love it. I love it. So this will actually kind of go seamlessly into this next question because you've talked about preparation. And I like that too, that idea of competing isn't just in the day. It's all the stuff leading up to the day. And you and I both have seen people along the way where it's like, man, they've got the stuff, but they're mm -hmm. not doing the things necessary to prepare and be ready to compete. So mm -hmm. I'd love to hear a little bit about how you prepare with regards to film and analytics. So yeah. it's funny, Kate and I were actually watching the, the 1992 all-star game yesterday, you know, mm -hmm. and it's crazy watching an old baseball game now. Cause like they don't even have the score on the screen, right? Yeah. Like 
They're, you don't have the pitch analytics and all that. So film has been around forever, but analytics mm-hmm. is coming on full force too. So I would love to hear about how you use that combination of film and analytics to help you prepare and help you compete at a high level. Yeah. I think the first thing that I'll say is that they're just tools. Yeah. They are not answers. And like the one thing that I've kind of realized over my career, whether it be in baseball is, or outside of baseball is the people that ask really, really good questions are usually more successful than the people that know all the answers. Yeah. And so like, these are tools and you always have to ask how, how does a Rapsodo report help me get somebody out? Right. How does a heat chart help me get somebody out? You have to overlay the two. You have to overlay what you know about yourself. And then you have to overlay the analytics and you have to say, all right, where is the overlap Mm. in these? Yep. Because, you know, this is take, for example, if a batter is hitting, you know, 100 off of fastballs, well, what type of fastball? Right. How hard is that fastball? How does that fastball move? And not, nothing in sports takes place in a vacuum. Yep. And I think that's my number one. I, I love the information. I love that it's available. But my biggest issue with a lot of the analytics is that they're computed in a vacuum. Right. A lot of times. And there's no context to what is happening. And in a perfect world, like that might be the case. but okay, so a guy's hitting 100 on a fastball. What if I can't, can't command my fastball that day? Right, right. What if, I, what if I can't even get into counts to throw my fastball? Right. Um, you can't just tell a guy to go out and throw it because then it's going to get waffled all over the yard. <laughs> um, so realizing that they're a tool, and I guess when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, but you need to fill out your tool belt. Right. So the analytics might be a screwdriver. The strength and conditioning might be, you know, a okay. hammer. The you use your wrench. You just you need to fill your tool belt with all of these things to go get a job done and build. You know, metaphorically build build the house, accomplish task. Right. Okay. So to kind of play off of that, and I'm going to use uh, a youth sports analogy because especially like the girls that I coach because my daughter's a little bit older. There's a lot of this, they'll watch a team play and they'll be like, oh, they're really good or, oh, they do this really well. And so the thing that I always try and redirect them towards is, hey, look, we can't control how they play, but we can absolutely control our performance and how we do things. So coming mm-hmm. back to your your situation where you're pitching in baseball, how much of it is just, hey, this is about me taking care of what I can, con- what I can control mm-hmm. versus like what they like to do. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, is it just about yeah. you doing what's best for you or is it matching and trying to figure out what they're weak at like how does that work for you you know i i have a going into a game i have a pretty good idea of what a guy or a team is going to try to do but i would say 80 percent of the time i end up not going with that game plan okay like there are there are certain things that i might fall back on in situations but the game usually dictates the way that I pitch. Okay. The situation dictates the way that I pitch. Yeah. And what I see a lot is a failure to make adjustments. So, and the time frame to adjust gets smaller and smaller as the ability levels get bigger and bigger. Right. So when you're when you're with your with your girls and you're coaching, you might be able to make adjustments by the half. Sure. You get, you know, you once you get into high school and college, like you might have to make adjustments by the possession. Right. When you get into, you know, at the higher levels, I might have like a pitch that I have to make an adjustment. I might have to see the swing, read the swing, know the situation. And my like, then I have to say, all right, I got to make an adjustment here because that's not what I need to be doing right now. Right. How mentally taxing is that? I'm more mentally tired at the end of a game than I am physically tired. Yeah. And then and then the other thing too as a starting pitcher is that 
I've got to get you out three, maybe four times. Right. So I can't show you my cards early. Right. Because there's going to be a situation later in the game where like, it might be the moment that I have to make a pitch. Right. And, um, this is going to sound weird, but over the, over the course of my career, I've realized, you know, there's this really big emphasis you hear like, Oh, one pitch at a time, one play at a time, one possession at a time. Well, I've realized that. So if I make a hundred pitches in the course of a game, there's really probably only seven or eight pitches that I have to make that are going to determine the outcome of the game. That's crazy. It's it's not that the other pitches don't matter. Sure. But for me, it's been the ability to recognize what pitches I have to make and then throw it in overdrive mentally, physically in those moments. Hmm. And, it, and, it, and it's the same for, for every single sport. I mean, you look at you look at basketball, like whether it's a defensive stop or whether it's converting or what, you know, whatever it might be. There's really in the, in the course of a basketball game, there's really probably only four to five possessions yeah. that are going to determine the flow of the game. Yeah. I mean, the same, the same goes a big stop, a big offense, you know, whatever it might be. And that's not saying that the rest of the game doesn't matter because it does, but the ability to recognize those situations and say, all right, we got to ratchet up the intensity right here. Cause this is it. Yes. This is the game. Yep. One more question on this thread. Cause this is fascinating when you've got that big moment or that big pitch, mm -hmm. right? You've got your process. How do you, and and maybe it's the same every pitch and you just know it a mm -hmm. little bit more in that instance, but like, how do you focus or calm or center yourself to make sure like the emotions or the adrenaline don't take over? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think a lot of it is just when you have played a game for so long, you, you don't allow that moment to get bigger than it really is. Yeah. That's a good point. Yes. That's a very, very important moment, but you know, so like in Korea, pitching in the Korean series, it's just another game. Right. It's just another pitch. Like I've made thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of pitches. Like there's no, when I allow the external pressures to dictate the way that I feel about the pitch, I need to step off the rubber and I need to say, you've thrown a fastball down and away 57,000 times <laughs> right. in your career. Right. You like you are prepared. Yeah. You are ready to make this pitch and you've done it a thousand times. Yep. It doesn't matter how loud the crowd is. It doesn't matter what the other guy is doing. It doesn't even matter if he knows that it's coming. Yep. Like just make the pitch. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. Many people who aren't around pro athletes all the time think that everything in their life is always hunky dory mm -hmm. 24 seven. They live these perfect, like sheltered lives. But as you well know, there are a lot of ups and downs mm -hmm. that can happen yeah. in a road trip, a season, throughout a career. So I'd love to hear about how you have managed to deal with all those ups and downs and stay as level-headed as you have throughout. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, where to start? I mean, I feel like <laughs> sport, like life in general is just one big ebb and flow of failure and success. Right. And it's you know, the ability to like learn. So I don't, I think the only time we ever fail is when we don't learn from that experience. Yep. I don't really like the word fail at all. Also differentiating between, and I think a lot of athletes don't understand this. There is a huge difference in failing at a task and being a failure. Oh, that's good. That's good. Usually 99.9% .9 of the time, we just fail at a task. Right. Like, that's all that it is. Yep. Like, we mess up. We're human beings. We fail at the task. Very rarely, if ever, is anybody a failure because they didn't accomplish a task. Right. And differentiating those, I think, is key. Yep. And it's just, you know, you realize through the course of your career, like, it's just a game. Like right. I, I, I've held on to this game like so tightly through the course of my life. And I've gotten to the point now where like, you know, I remember, you know, just like background, some of the stuff that I've been through. So like, our daughter was diagnosed with a congenital heart defect 
uh, before she was born. She's had two open heart surgeries. And I remember this conversation vividly with my wife. We're sitting at Riley Children's Hospital in Indianapolis. And I looked at her and I said, I think if, if somebody came to me today and told me I couldn't play baseball anymore, I think I would be okay. I think I'd be okay. Because I've started to realize like there's more important things to life than succeeding at a task right. of sport. Like sport is merely, you know, I think this is a perspective too, is sport is a means for formation. It is not about wins and losses. Yes. And the priority of a coach, the priority of an athlete is to realize that sport is just a vehicle for formation. And when those priorities get out of whack and you see it all the time, and I understand in the moment, like it's important and people's livelihoods are dependent upon wins and losses. And when your job is dictated on your winning percentage, it is very, very hard to realize the purpose of sport and the right. purpose of being a coach. But I, I mean, I would just ask the question to most coaches, like, did you get into coaching to have a really good win percentage? And I would venture to say that majority would say, no, I didn't. I got into coaching because I love to help people. Yep. I love to teach people. And always coming back to that and realizing that you have moments in your life as a coach where you can be, you know, I go back to Coach Lathrop, where you're planting seeds along the way. Yep. And there's, uh, not to get too metaphorical or deep here, but, but there's two types of, of people in this world that I've realized. There's, there's sowers and there's reapers. Mm. And as a coach, you have to be okay with being a sower. You have to be okay with planting the seeds, caring for the seeds. And then oftentimes you turn the success over to somebody else. Yep. And they reap all of the benefits that you've put the hard work in for. Yep. And that is like a very, very difficult place to be because we want recognition. We want to feel special. We want to feel like we're important. But as a coach, man, you're you're a sower. Yeah. Like you do the dirty work. You know, you're waking up at four in the morning, grabbing a cup of coffee and writing programming. And you might not know the impact that you make in an athlete's life until 10, 15, 20, 30 years down the road. Yep. You just, you just don't know. And you, it's, it's hard to realize that, but you have to be okay with it. Yeah. That's such a great point. And I remember growing up playing basketball and the basketball coach that I had all throughout high school always told me, he's like, sports are such a great vehicle to learn about yourself and learn about life. And that mm -hmm. always stuck with me. And I still use that with the girls and boys that I coach today. It's like, Hey, look, like, I know it's not fun to lose, but all the things that you derive from this, right? Like learning to compete, learning to work as a team, communication. There's so many benefits that you can extract from sports. And I just mm -hmm. love that idea of it being like this formative tool versus just like you said, it's not just about the task at hand. Do we win? Do we mm -hmm. lose? If you look at it in that binary sense, it's not nearly as rewarding, right? Yep. Yeah. hundred percent. That's cool. really good. Very cool. Really good. Okay. Big question time, guy. If you could alter right. the space-time continuum and give young Josh Lynn Bloom one piece of advice, what would it be? Don't take the game so seriously. Was it when you had your daughter and she had to go through all yeah. that stuff that you figured that out? Yeah. Yeah, that was probably right about the time. And I don't, I don't think, you know, when I came back to the United States to play, everybody talked about, oh, it was, you know, it was Josh's. It was that he learned two new pitches and – that's why he was so, I don't think that was it at all. Yeah. I think it was, it was because I stopped holding onto the game so tightly. Mm. I think it was because I knew at the end of the day, it didn't, it didn't affect who I was because I, I lost a game or I pitched poorly. I wasn't a failure. I failed at his task. Right. You know, I've got four little kids that their eyes are on me all the time. Yeah. They're watching how, how dad responds. And it's gotten harder because my son now knows about baseball 
And he usually asks me why I pitched bad or why. I did that <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I wish he didn't know as much. Um, my girl, my girls are great. I love my girls. They're unbelievable. They just want to, they just want to hug. Right. They want to kiss and they want me to tuck them in. Palmer wants to break down the whole game, pitch sequencing. <laughs> no, I, I just don't want to do that. Right. Right. <laughs> but yeah, it's don't take the game so seriously. I had a, uh, manager tell me one time um and i'm gonna butcher this but he's like the game doesn't know that it's more than a game mm. the game just thinks knows it's a game right we make it more important than it is i got you and it's just a game right like it's just a game like i think about playing basketball with my son like that's why i continue to do what i do because at some point in my life like it was a game like right. I wanted to be Nolan Ryan in the World Series. And that was fun. But at some point the game becomes more than a game. And it's like stepping back and being like, it's just a game. Like it's supposed to be fun. Right. Yeah, I get paid to do it. Yeah, it's how I support my family, but like it's still just a game. Yeah. I love it, dude. Okay. Last but not least, lightning round. I got six got questions it. for you. Your answer can All be right. as long or short as you like. So Number one, I think I know the answer to this one, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What's your career highlight up to this point? Jeez Louise. There's so many. How do you pick one? I don't know. Do you want to give a couple? Well, I mean, so, I mean, my last two years in Korea were uh, the best years of my career. One, back-to-back, -back, what, their, what their Cy Young award is. My last year there, I won an MVP, uh, won a Korean series. So just from like an accomplishment standpoint, that, yep. and then, you know, earning a contract back in the United States, I think was, was really cool. Just from the standpoint that like I set out, you know, in 2015, when I went to Korea, like I was totally ready to finish my career there. Right. Then I started to think, I was like, if I, if I need to, if I ever want to go back to the United States, I need to be the best player in Korea. Like wow. not just, okay, I need to be the best. How do I get there? Yeah. So it wasn't necessarily that I was able to come back to the United States and sign with the Milwaukee Brewers, but I think it was the accomplishment of that goal that I need to be the best. Yeah. And then I won an MVP and I was the best. Yeah. That for me, I think is probably the highlight. For sure. To have such a big and lofty goal. And to actually do it, you're like, man, that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. St okay. So, cool. I, so side question on that. Did anything change? Or is it, again, just this whole idea of preparation? You know, you took the game less seriously and it just kind of came together for you? Or Yeah, I just, I just knew myself so well. And even yeah. in Korea, I failed. Right. 2015, I was really, really good. 2016, I was terrible. Didn't <laughs> know if I was going to come back. And that was when we had Monroe. So then I came back to the U.S. I was with Pittsburgh. Opportunity came back up to go back to Korea, and I went back to really, really well. So, yeah, I think it's like this culmination of events that, you know, everything that we've talked about today and then just really, really knowing what it is that I'm good at. Yeah, that's um, awesome. And I still fight it. Like, I still fight external voices. Oh, you're, you're this, you're that, you're this. And I think last year I got into that a little too much. Sure. And then I had to take a step back and say, nope, like, this is who I am. Right. I love this that. is who I am. And this is how I pitch. Love it. Okay. Number two, maybe you can't say this, but I'm going to ask anyway, worst hitter to go against. It's going to sound weird. Uh, Corey Hart, old yeah. Brewers, long time. Uh, my rookie year, he looks like he's 10 feet tall in the box <laughs> and he can cover both batters boxes. And I don't know that I ever got him out, but I mean, I've faced, you know, Albert Pujols. I've faced, you know, Matt Holiday, Lance Berkman, Adrian Beltre, like some really, really good players. And it's, it's always, there's always like that one guy, like they just... Corey Hart, like, like really Corey Hart? <laughs> like seriously? I like, guess. That's Corey why I Hart. asked. That's why I asked. That's interesting, man. Yeah. Okay. So now this next one, I'm really interested in too. Outside of yourself, who is the nastiest pitcher you've seen operate and what makes you say that? Man, so many good ones. 
because I've played with so many unbelievable ones. I'm going to have to say that Clayton Kershaw, when he won his MVP, Cy Young, those years, it was unbelievable. Yeah. I've never seen anything like it. Obviously, what Jacob deGrom's doing right now is unbelievable, but Kershaw. Yeah. I mean, you you, you just talk about it. Was, it's funny. We had so our seventh inning guy, Matt Greer, that year that Kershaw won his first Cy Young and then his set, his back, I think it was back to back. He would he would come down to the to the bullpen in tennis shoes. <laughs> he he would eventually he would eventually go put his cleats on, but he would give our bullpen coach like a heart attack every day. <laughs> but Kershaw would pitch, and he's like, Kenny Howell was our bullpen coach at the time, and he'd be like, Matt, you need to put your spikes on. <laughs> he's like, Kenny Kershaw Kersh is going eight, and Kenley's going to close it like. I'm not pitching today. <laughs> there is no chance that I'm pitching. And I'm pretty sure, I mean, he might have only pitched once or twice that year, the days that Kershaw. <laughs> just, That's was just amazing. Like, I mean, you talk about like dominance, like there's guys that can do, I mean, it was, every game was like seven innings, two hits, no runs, eight innings, one hit. Then it was just like every single day it was, it was like something special was going to happen. Yeah. And I, like from a consistency standpoint, I mean, it was, just, it was unbelievable. It really was. Okay. Another side note to this. Was there anybody coming up, and you talked about this before, like we're n nobody's self-made, but was there mm -hmm. anybody other than that pitcher that you talked to back in the day that like early in your career helped kind of form you or took you aside and said, hey, look, this is how we do things or this can mm -hmm. make you a better player? Yeah. I mean, Derek Lowe was probably one of the biggest in my career. Yeah. I was with the Texas Rangers. I was traded there, probably got a little too big for my britches, thought that I was better than I was, came into spring training, had a terrible spring training. They tell me that I'm moving to the rotation. I'm like, I'm a bullpen guy. This is dumb. I would <laughs> do that. And Derek, obviously, back and forth over his career from bullpen to starting, just kind of like whatever. And we're in San we're in the we're in San Antonio. We sit down and he was like, I've done this before. I know what you need to do. And he wrote down on a piece of paper, my five day routine, wrote down everything for me, walked me through it. Wow. Talked with him. I'd say little things have changed, but that routine I still follow to this day. And that was now 10 years ago, maybe. That's amazing. That's yeah. cool. Okay. Number four, talk to me about all this school, dude. What are you doing? What are you studying? How do you find time yeah. for it? I don't know how I find time for it. Uh, so, I mean, I think rewind a little bit. When I broke my tibia, I, I just thought to myself, I don't know what, if this was a serious injury and my career was over, what would I do? I don't have a degree. What would I do? Right. Like if I had to make a decision. So there is so much wasted time in sports and baseball. I was like, I need to like redeem this time. I need to use this time wisely. I need to inch towards a degree. Uh, so I finished my degree uh, about three weeks ago. I just took my final and submitted my final paper for um, my first master's. And then in April, we're still trying to figure out the what the degree looks like, but it's it's going to be in psychology and coaching. And there might be also a PhD in leadership. Wow. That goes along with that. So light work, man. Still, work, still working through it. I'm not that smart. It's more <laughs> so just the work and the process, like we've talked about yeah. uh, this whole time. But yeah, there's just so much downtime in sports. I was like, I'm, I need to use this wisely. Yeah. Uh, we're all, you know, we're all building bridges and transitioning to different stages of our lives. And I was like, I need to shorten this bridge. Yeah. So I love it. Okay. How is it being an athlete yourself now with young kids who play sports? It's hard. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. I mean, obviously you want, you know, I want my kids to do well. I want them to be the best, but it's just hard. And I don't, and I think this goes back to what we were talking about earlier. The purpose of sports is that I really think that sports are about formation. It's not about winning and losing. Yep. So dealing and seeing when people's priorities like get out of whack is hard for me 
Yeah. And then also more so with like my son and my daughters as well, I see their priorities get out of whack. And right. then it becomes about winning. It becomes about how many hits did I get? And like, I'm always trying to like rein them back in and get them to look at the game differently. Yeah. It, it's a hard, I mean, it's hard because I want them to be the best. Yeah. I want them to be the best. I want them to be good. Uh, but more so than anything, I think for me, I want them to love the game, yeah. whatever game they're playing. Like, I want them to come grab me and say, Daddy, let's go shoot hoops. Right. Let's play one on one. Daddy, let's go play catch. Our girls love gymnastics. And it's like, Daddy, let's go do flips. And it's like, well, I can't do flips. Well, <laughs> you can try. Yeah. So I, I want I want them to come get me in love because that's like serves as, you know, probably underneath anything like that's the that's the main foundation is loving the game. Yes. Loving what you do. You don't always have to like what you do. I don't like what I do a lot of times, but I do love it. Right. Um, and everything about it. OK. Last but not least, what's next for Josh Lindblom? I finish strong. I have a have a mentor uh, that, that I meet with. And I, I'm kind of at that stage in my career where I know that I'm towards the end of it. Yep. And I think in my mind, I always go to the future a little bit more of what that looks like. And he posed a very challenging question to me. And he just said, let's just say that this is your last year playing. Let's just say that. Yep. What does it look like you to finish strong? That's a good question. What, like, what does that look like? I'm constantly having to like adjust my priorities. I'm constantly having to, we, we have this like ideal priority list in our minds yep. where it's like, you know, I'm a dad or I'm a husband, I'm a dad, I've got work and it's, it's a challenging exercise to do, but like you list your ideal priorities and then you list what's actually filling your time and seeing how those do not match up yep. and, and finishing strong for me is I've got all this stuff going on. How do I finish strong in baseball? How do I prioritize that time? Yep. Because I can't, you know, can't go play golf because I don't have time like that. Playing golf isn't finishing strong. Right. How does school, how does school fit into that? Right. You know, how do you, how do you, work towards a, another master's and a PhD and also try to go get outs. Right. Like where does that fall on the priority list? And I'm, I'm really, I'm getting better at it, but it's, it's hard to do. So finish strong. What's it look like to finish the day strong? What's it look like to finish, you know, the week strong? What are those priorities? So that's kind of been like my thing I've been going back to lately is what, what does it look like to finish strong? I love it. Have you come up with an answer to that yet? Just exhausting all avenues yeah to finish strong we tell ourselves as athletes oh I'm, I'm eating well i'm working as hard as i can are you are you really doing that because i, I don't want to if this you know however more years i play like eventually there will be a last year right and i don't want to look back and say you didn't finish strong like right. you didn't you didn't finish strong right so whenever that last year is whether it's a year from now or 10 years from now well, what's that look like? I love it. Um, Josh, man, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. Where can my listeners find out more about you? I have a Twitter. I think it's Josh Lindblom 52. And then I have an Instagram at JL Boomer 25, maybe. That sounds right. If um, not, we'll find think, it. We'll get it in the show. Yeah, we'll so. find it. Throw it on. I love doing this and, you know, chopping it up yeah. with people that are like-minded. So shoot me a question. Shoot me a message whatever. I'm very available, very open. So if anybody listens to this and wants to talk, just let me know. I love it. Well, Josh, again, thanks so much for coming on, bro. This is really great. Appreciate it. All right, my friend, that does it for this week's show with Josh. Really hope you enjoyed it. I mean, I just, I think the world of this guy, I've known him for probably five or six years now. If you've ever met Josh, if you've ever spent time around Josh, yeah, he's a great baseball player and he can check that box, but man, he's just an amazing human being and somebody that I think the world of, when you look at his career and the ups and downs and the things that he's dealt with in his life, I just am so impressed with him. And, you know, obviously the baseball side is impressive, but I think the mental resilience 
and the kind of character that he has as a human being is what really stands out to me. So hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, small favor to ask, please share this episode with somebody who you think may benefit from it, right? It doesn't have to be somebody that's interested in pursuing high-level baseball. We all endure ups and downs in our career, whether we're a trainer, a coach, a rehab professional, whether we're in business or finance, doesn't matter where we pursue our passions, we all struggle at times. So if you know anybody that might be struggling or that needs to hear Josh's message, please take two seconds out of your day and share this with them because I think his story will really resonate with a lot of people. Okay, my friend, that does it for me. That does it for this week's episode. As always, thank you so much for your support. Love and appreciate you. And we'll be back next week with our next episode. Take care.